This is the Digging for Truth podcast, presented by the Associates for Biblical Research, demonstrating the historical reliability of the Bible through archaeological and biblical research. Have you ever wondered what it would be like to work on an archaeological dig site? How it all works and what kinds of things that are typically found and what they could mean? Are you required to wear a fedora? And what's the whip for? So we've got Henry Smith here, of course, along with Brian Wendell from the Bible Archaeology Report. And Brian was a recent first-time digger. So Brian, why don't you tell us where you went, what you did, and what your experience was like, and then maybe in a little bit we'll talk about how day-to-day archaeology works, and then some of the small discoveries that were made. Yeah, this was my first time getting to go on a dig uh, firsthand. I've, I've lived vicariously through others, through uh, watching the ABR updates on, uh, on Facebook and the, and the video updates they do. But this was my first time in the field myself. And I mean, it, it was absolutely amazing. It exceeded my expectations in every way. And uh, so we, my wife and I, joined as volunteers the ABR team at Shiloh. Shiloh, of course, is the place where the tabernacle stood for over 300 years. And when I think of Shiloh, I think of um, Joshua being at Shiloh, them setting up the tabernacle there, him allotting, we're told in, in the Bible, that's where he allotted the, the, the tribal areas, the territories, was, was at Shiloh. I think um, later in the Iron Age, I think of Eli and Hannah and Elkanah and, and Samuel, those are the the, the stories that come to mind when I think of Shiloh. And so, or, or as they say in Israel, Shiloh. So um, I, m- I may go back and forth, Shiloh, Shiloh. If I do, that's <laughs> just um, North American pronunciation versus uh, Israeli pronunciation. And it was just a, it was an amazing experience to actually be there. And, and it was amazing for two reasons, I think. First of all, was the fact that you're digging in a place that is, that has a known history, right? If, if you go to Israel, there are a lot of places that, you know, maybe something happened here or that represent something that happened. But this is a site that we know was Shiloh. We know this was where these biblical people walked and lived. And so it was a pretty, amazing experience to be at a place where some important biblical events happen. So on a spiritual level, it was it was pretty amazing. From an archaeological perspective, I'm, I'm doing a master's degree in archaeology and biblical history right now. And so this was part of my field school practicum for that. And, and so to actually learn the process of archaeology and see it firsthand um, and participate in it was a pretty amazing experience too. To The, the first day when I actually you got down on my knees and you, you, the trowel, you're starting to use your trowel and you're digging in the Holy Land was a pretty, just a, just an amazing experience. And so Henry, you're the administrative director of this dig. How long has ABR been digging at this site and how many volunteers normally come? Brian is probably one of lots. Um, yeah. Can you give us a little bit background on that? Yeah. So Shiloh, the Shiloh dig started in 2017. Uh, we had a little time off because of the uh, COVID in between. So, but this was our fifth full season at Shiloh. So it kind of, it's interesting because our previous dig at a site we identified as I was a little less well-known or maybe you might say marketable, you know. Uh, We had a strong uh, dig that we had developed there. But when we transitioned to Shiloh from the other dig, we were able to keep the momentum going from a volunteer standpoint, a development standpoint, an organizational standpoint. So once we announced that we're going to Shiloh now, that really drew an even bigger interest from people. Now, what, what's fascinating is the number of people that we have we now have. Uh, last year, we had probably around 150 people, which was really strong like a really, really good turnout. Like we were very pleased with that. And we saw last year, we could see the signs coming that we were going to have a huge year. We had estimating over 230, 235 people total, plus day diggers, people coming, you know, for one day to dig, like a busload of students from a seminary, Dallas and um, the master seminary, for example. 
So there's a lot of things to say about it. We could talk about archaeologists, many, many different angles we could take of this. I guess from my perspective, just from a an energy level, an excitement level, the the number of people, the kind of people that come on our dig, how hard they work, how cooperative they are, the synergy that gets developed, the spiritual energy that's there, the affection for scripture. It's really quite remarkable. It's you can kind of quantify the people that you have. You know, you got this number this week and this number next week, and there's a lot of work involved in all that. But like the sum of some of the parts is greater mm. than the whole, if you want to say it that way. So you say 235 people, but you feel like you're getting the work of 400 people. Mm. Uh, not because we drive them hard, but because they want to do the work. They love They love what they're doing. So that's just one aspect of it for me. And particularly, I think, you know, from a personal standpoint, you know, our previous dig at Kerb at Elma Cotter, which we identified as I, our first season, we had 19 people. Hmm. As the administrative director, I couldn't even go because we were operating in the red. And Hmm. so we didn't want to add more costs, uh, you know, my flight and hotel and all that. So I stayed home. Hmm. And so to see this thing, grow and grow and grow really has been really a blessing. I mean, I don't know if we're the largest dig in Israel officially, but if we're not, it's close. And mm. I doubt there's many digs that are are this big. Not that only size matters in terms of the number of people, but it does sort of feed your energy and encourage you when, uh, as a staff, we've done a lot of work over the, over the past decade and a half to get to a place like this. So, uh, that's uh, sort of the administrative yeah. director talking, you know. Mm-hmm. But so the dig is about four weeks of actual digging. It is, let alone the, the year long preparation, all that kind of stuff. Yes. But it's four weeks of actual digging, and and what what's the average? Most people come for like a week. Like how? I I would say probably closer to two, just to make it worthwhile from a financial standpoint to pay for the flight and come over. And, you know, when you get, if you're just a week, you're only just getting a rhythm going. A lot of people that do come for a week can only do it for different reasons. And then they're like, I'm coming back, mm-hmm. you know? So, and they pay uh, their own way. Most people, they're volunteers, right? They're, yeah. They're paying, yeah. And that's the like, other remarkable part about this is uh, people are paying out of their own pocket. So it's really a donation to the ministry unofficially, if you want to say it that way, mm-hmm. because they're paying for the cost of, of cover and all the expense to go. So I would say the average is two. And we have some people that are there for the full program, usually college students or people who are retired. Mm-hmm. You know, most people can't go for four weeks, but uh, I should add too, we're unique. Other digs are very strict about that. They want people for an extended period of time. And, and in some ways it's understandable, uh, but we we're very flexible because we want to invite people to have the experience Mm -hmm. of being there. So we work pretty hard to make it work. So Brian, when you got on the ground and, uh, you know, kind of started day one at the dig, can you kind of walk us through what your experience was like kind of on that first day waking up at I don't know when you woke up. When did, when, when did you just start? <laughs> <laughs> An ungodly hour. I'm sure you were jet lagged. we but... wake up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, um, I, I was there for the first two weeks of the dig, my wife and I. And so, um, yeah, you wake up at, at 3.45 in the morning. That's when I, I get up because uh, the bus starts loading at 4.45 and I need to get showered and have breakfast and and uh, get my gear together. And then we're, we're on, the, uh, on the bus and... Um, the the very first day we were there, we were basically just getting things set up and and um, looking at the um, the old sandbags that lined the squares and replacing some of those and getting the gear out of the the container and getting all of that organized. That was kind of not officially day one, although it was our first day on the site. And so when we got there. Gary Byers took all of us who were uh, rookies and uh, took us on a tour of the site around and and a little bit of the history so that we understood what was happening. And then uh, at the site and the different uh, areas and and ABR digs on the the northern part of the tell, the northern slope there. And so week one, I was digging in an area that was, that that we're calling, the uh, ABR is calling a monumental structure. 
it's basically this gigantic structure that that appears to have the dimensions of the tabernacle. And we're told in some ancient Jewish writings that the people at Shiloh, the Jewish people at Shiloh, uh, built walls for the tabernacle and put the tent over top. And uh, so the question of where the tabernacle stood has always been one of those things that people have debated. There's a a northern platform. But when I got there and, and looked at where the northern platform is, the thing that struck me was it didn't seem to me to be a very good candidate because it's outside of the city walls. And I didn't think that they would necessarily set that up there. If this is their holy place, I would think that they would want to defend that. And then we got looking at, um, you know, some people said it's on the summit and some people on the Southern approach, but ABR has, has uncovered over the last number of years, this gigantic monumental building that has the dimensions of the tabernacle. It's facing east West, as you would expect, a tabernacle or a temple to, to be situated. Um, there's a, another wall that that splits it into thirds, so it's um, that wall would then make the the holy of holies. And so we were digging uh, the first week in the northeast corner. And I just had a wonderful team to work with. Uh, Jordan, my square supervisor, was was just so good at, at filling us in on the history of where we were. He took us over to the corner and he said, you know, now last year we paced off where we thought this corner should be and just started a, a quick dig and, and quickly discovered, sure enough, here's a corner of a wall. And so our goal the first week was to articulate that wall, to dig down, try and see how deep we could get. Is there a second row? of stones. Uh, One row of stones doesn't necessarily mean a wall, but if you've got multiple rows, multiple courses of stones, then you've got a wall there. So we were working and I'll tell you, it was a, if this turns out to be the tabernacle and and I, I personally think it's a great candidate for the tabernacle. We're finding ABR has found a number of things over the past number of years uh, in and around this structure that are are cultic in nature. That means that they were used in worship. So the ceramic pomegranate, which was a a symbol, pomegranate was a symbol that was common in ancient Near Eastern worship, three horns of a four-horned altar in that area. Um, And so we were digging in that particular area. And so we started off and I was digging on the inside of the of the wall and the most of the team was on the outside. And just to be digging in what might turn out to be the tabernacle was a pretty amazing thing. I remember driving on the bus one morning, they do devotionals every morning on the bus. And uh, a friend of, friend of mine, J.J. Routley, who's a professor at Emmaus Bible College, was doing a devotional one morning and he was talking about how uh, the priesthood of believers, how we're all uh, priests of God. And so when I got to the dig that morning, uh, I was inside in in this what may be the tabernacle structure. And and I, I remember just reflecting as I'm digging there, I am a priest of God and I am in the place quite possibly where the priests of Yahweh of old were. And it was a, it was just a powerful moment to be digging in that particular space. And so we were, we were able to, um, to dig down. I remember uh, I paced off, we, we got the dimensions of where we thought how wide we thought the tabernacle would be. And I paced it out along the Eastern end because we were only dealing with the Northeast corner. And so I thought I would, I would go to the, um, to the Southeast corner, paced off where it was, and then kind of went to the middle where about I would think kind of the, the entrance would have been on the Eastern end. And I remember just standing there and I, and I pulled out my phone and I, I pulled out my Bible app and I started reading the story of, of Hannah uh, praying there, and it says that that Eli was sitting by the doorposts of the tabernacle there. And I remember thinking, I am sitting right, and I'm reading this story. How many thousands of years later, in the place where this might very well have happened, it was a pretty amazing thing. Now, I should note that we were excavating, and it became pretty clear that we were digging through a Roman level, and so. What uh, appears to have happened is the the Romans came along and um, and kind of said, "Wow, my goodness, that's a good wall. Let's build our wall on top of that well. Look, wall looks like a great foundation." So the, the Romans built their walls on top of the Iron Age walls underneath. So we were starting to go down, but we only 
kind of the week that we were there, we're only digging in Roman era stuff. That was pretty clear from the pottery. And so the team after us continued down. I didn't hear how far they got. I suspect in future years, they'll continue down. I know on the opposite end, the Western end, they did get down below the Roman level to the Iron Age walls underneath. And that's what we're, we were starting the process of where we were there. So the Roman period is kind of time of around the time of Jesus and kind of early AD. Before that is the, is it the Hellenistic, the Greek period? And then before that, is it the Bronze Age or the Iron Age? Uh, well, bef- yeah, before the Greek is, uh, you have the Persian era. Okay. Persian, yeah. Yeah. And then uh, as you go, so we're walking backwards, backwards now. So now we walk back to around the destruction of the, of the temple, uh, 586, 587. So your Iron Age 2 there, late Iron Age 2. So uh, Iron Age 1 is generically, Brian would just say, time of David, uh, a little bit earlier than that. Yeah. 1200 yeah, starts. Okay. Right. To, yeah. Yeah, okay. starts, yes, 1200 BC. So that would include the time of the judges into the time of David okay. kind of thing. So that must have been a really awesome experience. Like you get, get that day one, you're like, oh, wow, this is cool. This could be, and what if I am? But then once you kind of have that moment, then you have to get down to the practical, getting your, your hands dirty, right? So <laughs> how does, how does can you tell yeah. me who's never done it, what, how does the what's the practicality of of digging in a, a square? I guess can you explain some of that? Yeah, sure. And and as a rookie, right? I've studied this with my with my coursework and taken a kind of an online field school. But this was my first time actually in the field. And so we set up our square five meters by five meters is the square you dig in, and your goal is to drain the the square like you would drain a bathtub. So we, we don't want to dig holes. And that's that's really hard when you come across something really exciting. I remember you know, hitting my first intact Roman jar handle, right? I just wanted to dig the whole thing right out, just dig a deep hole right there. To, but you, you've got to follow the process of, of digging everything down evenly around it. Hmm. Um, and it. And it'll eventually you know, come to light and come out. And it did. Um, same thing. We found a, a taboon, which is a, an ancient oven, essentially uh, the remains of it. Anyways, a, a rock had fallen. One of the rocks from the wall had tumbled off and fall, fallen on it. But you know, you, you, you want to dig right down to the, under it, but you've got to just dig it down carefully together all, um, all at once. And of course for our square, our square had a bit of a slant in it. So we had to start at the upper side to, to bring it all down to get it level first. And then we were able to carry on down uh, past the wall that we were trying to trying to uh, expose. Um, and so, I mean, my goal was, I, I kept asking, uh, you know, Jordan, because he's the square supervisor. Okay, like, tell me if I'm doing something wrong. Like, the, I'm a rookie here. I want to, <laughs> I want to get this right. And so, you know, we're doing it. And so, so you're you're scraping the dirt and you're looking for things because the last thing I wanted to do was miss something big, because now we have a great process set up at uh, at Shiloh or Shiloh there, um, where you 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 basically are excavating. You you scrape the dirt as you lower it. Any big rocks, like like say a hand size rock. You would throw in a rock. Uh, we have these uh, buckets made out of uh, recycled tires called goofas, and so you would you would put your rocks in the goofa, and then that would be taken and disposed of. Your dirt and small rocks would go in a different goofa, and that would be taken over to be dry sifted to see if you missed anything. Well, I didn't want to miss anything, so it's that. It's that, you know, you don't want to go too slow that you're being so meticulous, you're not getting anything done, but you also want to make sure that you're going, um, you don't go too fast and you miss everything. Um, And so you're going to take that over. And and of course, you're finding pottery all the way. Uh, I think, um, Henry, you would know, is it like 1,500 or 2,000 pieces of pottery a day the whole team finds at at Shiloh? Yeah. Yeah. There's tons of pottery coming out. That was the number Dr. Stripling would talk about like last year and the previous season. So with our huge increase in volunteers, I would imagine that number probably jumped up, I'm going to guess, closer to three. And maybe I'm, I could be wrong, but but uh, yeah, it's a, the, the bottom line is it's a lot of pottery. And they're all tiny, <laughs> tiny little, tiny little 
shards and triangles and bits and pieces and a large percentage, right, Brian? Would you say or small yeah, stuff? Yeah, most most are coming out are small stuff. Sometimes, uh, like I exposed an intact uh, jar handle, Roman jar handle. Sometimes you get bigger pieces, and then of course sometimes you get pieces, and you're trying to figure out. Is this a rock or is this a a piece of pottery? And and so when I started off, I, I would you know I'd be going to Jordan or or Emily who was our assistant a square supervisor, and, and they kind of showed me if you just kind of tap it on a rock, a rock on a rock has a rock sound. A piece of pottery on a rock has a different sound, mm. and so you kind of got to know the difference as you as you were going. So some are small. Um, most the vast majority are small and they would be just disposed of after on the dump pile after they had done pottery reading the next day. And so, but all of that goes in a pottery pail. And then, so your pottery pail at the end of the day, you're going to take down and and you're going to wash. So the very last thing we do every day is we wash it, uh, all this pottery and, uh, and set it out to dry so that the next day, Scott, the director and Jordan, our square supervisor, go down and, and they read the pottery there and and uh, Abigail is there. Um, she's a um, our objects registrar assistant dig director, I believe, and, and Gary Byers is there as well. And so they're, they're all reading the pottery and that is they're, they're determining what era the pottery comes from. Okay. This pottery changes through the eras. So uh, for example, the second week I can talk about later, we were digging in late Bronze Age. Uh, uh, late Bronze Age stratum. So that's the time of Joshua. And that pottery was very different the second week than it, than the first week when we were digging through a Roman level. Mm-hmm. And so um, Roman levels kind of sloppy pottery and and they have different, oftentimes a kind of a common motif is this kind of groove um, that the Romans and Byzantines used of, of kind of lines through the outside of the pottery. So th- there's just um, ways to do that. So that comes at the end of the day, but throughout the day, you're taking all of your stuff, you're taking it to the dry sift, and there you put it in this big rectangular tray that's got a, a screen on the bottom, and then you shake shake it to so all the dirt falls through, and what's left are rocks and and possibly bones and pieces of pottery. Sometimes you'll find something um, that was missed in the square. I, I know we heard that that another team uh, had found a, a scarab in their dry sift. So it was missed in the ground when they excavated, but when it went to dry sift, they found a scarab hmm. um, in it. And then from that, you take all the material you've dry sifted, you put them in these mesh bags and everything needs to be tagged because you need to know where it came from in the square. So there's, it's amazing how, I think that was one of the biggest things that hit me was, man, this is a well-oiled machine going on here at Shiloh when you've got so many people digging in so many squares and yet everything is being tracked and traced with uh, tagging so that if they find something at wet sift, they know exactly what square and what locus it came from. And so our second week digging, we heard uh, later on that they had found a, a coin in the wet sift. So that meant that we missed it in the square and it went to dry sift. They missed it and they found it at wet sift. But that's the process working so that you you catch all of the finds. And so um, it was it was amazing to see how this all goes on. It's like this gigantic dance, if you will, where everybody's doing their part. And and uh, I just found the people there, to me, that was, I think, the biggest thing um, is to is to meet the people. I mean, I should have mentioned early on, I should have mentioned early, one of the highlights of Shiloh for me was meeting Henry face-to-face for the first time. Yeah. <laughs> for, first time we got to meet, I mean, we've done, we've done uh, Digging for Truth so many times, and then finally... Uh, you know, when we met down in the lobby for the first time, it was, that was a precious it moment. Was. So you, I you, agree. being able to be there and, you know, be on site with him and, and, you know, people like Jordan and Scott and Gary and Abigail and, and, and the people that we worked. I know my wife did a lot of work at the wet sift and, and got to work with Frankie, um, close, close with Frankie down there. And they're just great people at ABR and they do a great job of taking, um, rookies like me and training us on what to do and overseeing us so that volunteers can come in and feel like they are being a productive part and they are being a productive part. And so I, I worked with people our first first year, 
uh, first week there, we had um, a girl who was 16 years old there with her dad digging. Uh, she celebrated her 16th uh, birthday there that week we were there. And um, uh, we were also digging with someone who was in his 70s. And so it just it's it's runs the gamut of 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 ages there, and so it was just a, a great opportunity to work with some really good people uh, at at uh, Shiloh. So day in day out, <clears throat> you're arriving early, you're working in a square, digging down each level, and then you bag it. It goes to sifting, dry sifting, then it goes to wet sifting, and then at the end of the day, they're looking at some of the finds that have been found and they're tagging all this stuff. Henry, how many squares are kind of active daily? Is it, is there an average? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, you know, our, what do we say, it, Brian, a 10 to 12? Yeah, I'm trying Does to think of how right? many different colors were down at wet sifting because every square has a different color of mesh bag. And when you go down to wet sifting, um, Every sifter has a lineup, and and the, each sifter only does um, sifting from one, um, one of the squares. square. And okay. there would be, yeah, probably I, I would have said eight to ten, maybe. Yeah, um, squares going. Now that was the two weeks that I was there, so it was uh, it was a great experience. And the second week might have been even better than the first week. Hmm. I, I don't even know if I can say that. Because, I mean, the first week I'm digging in a monumental structure that may. It well be the tabernacle. Um, mm -hmm. I should mention maybe on that too, that um, the next week, another, we moved to a different square. Okay. It's called Area D and it is a, a late Bronze Age favisa, which is a, a pit where they bury the things that they've offered in sacrifice. So the bones that have been burned and, mm. and the pottery that they've used. And, and so all of that gets buried. So I'll talk about that in a minute. But the second week, another team took over up where we were on the, on the eastern, um, the eastern wall there. And they uncovered, uh, they went to the next square. They, they uncovered another wall on the, on the Southeast side, ex exactly where we would expect a corner to be still Roman era. And they uncovered a socket stone, which was pretty amazing. Right, right in C2, where you would expect it. I actually took a picture of my wife standing in what would be um, the gate of this of this monumental structure. Now, albeit at the Roman level, so probably the the Iron Age would have been down below, and and maybe the Romans reused that socket stone from. Uh, the earlier time period, I don't know. Maybe that that is the socket stone from the from the tabernacle. We I, I don't know. We'll have to wait until the interpretation comes. But it was pretty exciting to see that come out there. So for just a, a few people who may not know, could you kind of explain what a socket stone is? Yeah. And so also, it, what does in C two mean? Sure, sounds good. So uh, this socket stone would have been about um, I don't know. Uh, 15 to 20 inches in diameter. So it was massive and it's hollowed out in the middle and in the middle would have been a, a, a pole, a piece of wood on which the door was attached to swing. So it okay. would open and close and the, the pole would turn in that socket of the stone. So that's- So it um, grinds it down over time and that's how you get the- well, it likely was was ground out so that the the pole could fit in it to begin with, but okay. I'm sure it would have been ground out more over time too. And when you find a socket stone, sometimes you find it, it's been used in a wall uh, in secondary use, but in situ means that it's in the situation, the place that you would have uh, expected to find it in its original use, You and you found it. In, in a dig. You found it right there. It wasn't uh, didn't come from an antiquities market or something like that. You found it in the dig. In context, pretty, in a, in a yeah, scientific site. Okay. That's right. So that's very helpful then because you are able to then, to then study it within the archaeological context when it comes to interpreting, um, which kind of is the next step. So, so that was pretty exciting going on at, at where we had been the first week. But we moved to the eastern part of the tell. And uh, or the mound, the tell just means uh, mound um, where the the city was, and this was a late Bronze Age favisa. Now we ABR is not the one who came to that conclusion. Um, when Israel Finkelstein dug there in the 1990s, he was the one who dug these squares there and said this is a this is a favisa. Now 
he didn't um, attribute it to the Israelites. And he dated it, I believe, a little later than the pottery that we were finding seemed to indicate, seems to indicate it was a little earlier and so, or or vice versa. So we would say, uh, I think we're digging in what may be Israelite material from the sacrificial system there. Uh, seems to be what the the dating of the pottery tentatively is showing. And it was it was pretty neat. Our our goal was to take out the walls of the squares, several of the walls, three of them while I was there. Those are the walls are called bulks. And we were taking them out. They've they're 40 years old. They're unstable. We're going to remove them. So we we just take them right down to ground level and we're finding all sorts of material in them as well. So it was pretty exciting to be to be digging there. I, I remember I was working on one side of the bulk. This is day one, like within a half hour of, of starting. We get the tent set up. You start it every day. One of the beautiful things about getting up at 3.45 in the morning, I, I mean, I don't know that there are a lot of beautiful things about that, <laughs> but one of the beautiful things is that you arrive at Shiloh every morning to see the sunrise. Hmm. coming through the hills. And that is a beautiful thing. And so we're, we're not even digging a half hour. We get into it and um, I'm on one side and, a, and another digger um, named Irene, who was on our team, was on the other side of the bulk. And I turned to dump my, uh, my um, you're scraping the dirt into a, uh, a dust pan. And then I turned to put it in the goofa. And all of a sudden I hear Irene go, oh my goodness, and I thought, oh, was it like a spider or a, or a or a scorpion? Because we found some of those. Um, and she goes, "It's a scarab." And I look down, and right in the middle of the bulk, she's on one side, I'm on the other, is this beautiful white scarab sitting there that she had just uncovered. And so uh, we we took a look at it. We called Jordan over um, so that he can see it. And we, of course, you take a measurement to, to get your elevation where it was and you record everything. But just a beautiful scarab. Now, a scarab, just for our listeners who may not be familiar, is a, is a small amulet. I, I would say maybe the size of my baby fingernail. Um, so quite small. It's rounded on one side and carved to look like a dung beetle because Egyptians revered the dung beetle. And then on the other side, it's flat, and there are either images or hieroglyphics on the other side. Ours had this image. It kind of looked, um, it, it, we kind of joked that it kind of looked like rabbit ears, but it, I mean, hmm. it wasn't a rabbit. It was, um, we think it, it may be just kind of preliminary. I did some searching. So this is an ABR. This is me searching scarabs afterwards to find something similar. And it might have been something, a symbol that represented, you know, ma'at or ma'at, the Egyptian concept of, uh, of, of order and truth and justice and righteousness all kind of together. So that was really cool. So we were like, this is good. Day one, half hour in, we're finding good stuff. And then same thing, day one, I'm working on that. Um, by, by this point, Irene had moved down because she started to uh, uncover a silo, which is the circle, circular ring of stones that they would have, um, that, that the people dug in and, and lined with stones so they would have stored grain and stuff in there. So she's starting to, to do that. And I'm moved down. I'm working on the bulk and Ellen, our metal detectorist comes. Um, and so when Ellen comes, you've got to move all your tools out because they're metal. And so she's on one side of the bulk. I'm on the other side and she starts swinging her metal detector over where I was, I was digging. And all of a sudden you hear, you know, beep, 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 beep. Okay, this is good. She she takes her um, her little wand out, and she got a little wand for for more specifics. And so she's digging around, and, and she, in her hand it goes beep 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 beep. And so she she dusts it off, and then uh, she she looks up at me, and I look at her, and we both have big eyes. And I said, "Is that gold?" And she said, "Yes, it is." Wow. And so we called Jordan over. Like this is day one. <laughs> this is like this is like I'm thinking, man, this is I, I've hit the jackpot here. I'm in a great square to dig. And so a treasure hunt. Yeah. So we call Jordan over quietly because you don't want to make a big ruckus and have every other square empty and then you know everybody comes running and 
uh, we don't want to get Scott mad because nobody's working then. So I called quietly. I called Jordan over and he comes over and looks at it. And so it was, um, if I would describe it, I would say it was about uh, not quite an inch in length. It was, uh, if I take my hand and cup my hand to kind of make a little bit of a single hand cup, it would kind of look like that. And it had a clasp at the end. And um, it was just this beautiful, it was smooth. There was no markings on it. So kind of a a spoon type uh, cup shaped pendant that was out of gold. Now here's the cool thing. I think this is cool. So if we look at the pottery that's coming out, it's late Bronze Age pottery. So we're talking time of Joshua, we think. And we find this piece of gold. Well, a couple of weeks ago, when I got back, I was preaching. I'm a pastor here in Canada, and I'm preaching on the Exodus. And the Exodus is my topic. And I come to Exodus chapter 3, and I come across this verse in Exodus 3.22, where God tells Moses that um, when the people go, Pharaoh's going to harden his heart and, and God is going to bring the, these, he's going to show his wonders. And when you go, God says, I will make your people favorably, uh, favorable in the eyes of the Egyptians. And your Israelite women will ask the Egyptian women for their gold and silver jewelry. And so you will plunder the Egyptians. That's what the verse says. So I started doing some research. I thought, I wonder what Egyptian jewelry from the late Bronze Age looked like. I wonder if they had little pendants like this. So I just started searching. And sure enough, um, Egyptians had these types of necklaces called broad collar necklaces, which were, if you think of one string of of of, of a necklace, think of a necklace that had five or six or eight strings all together to make this big broad band that would go around your neck. And on each one of these strings would hang pendants, little pendants. And so I didn't find any that were identical to the one that we found, but I sure found a lot of these that I thought, this is amazing. So I emailed Jordan. I I messaged Jordan right away, our square supervisor. I said, is this like, is this a, you know, a possibility? And, uh, you know, he got back to me, he said, yeah, man, that's that's a great possibility. And so uh, this is my theory. My theory is that that little, uh, that little gold pendant was from one of these Egyptian necklaces that it, it comes, um, that would be my theory that it was offered in some way to the, to the Lord by one of these Israelite people, probably the next generation, because remember they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years and the, the generation that came out of Egypt died. And so this is, would have been part of an Egyptian necklace that they plundered from the Egyptians when the Israelites left in the Exodus that, that a child or grandchild then would have offered to Yahweh as a sacrifice. And, and here it is, 3,400 years later or so, we're digging it out of the ground there. And so for me, to make a connection like that as I'm preaching on this is a pretty exciting thing um, to see. To see, that. And that was day one. That was day one in the square that we're finding. <laughs> uh, it was in addition to, oh man, there's just so much I could talk about it. Uh, you know, the pottery that we were finding, some beautiful late bronze painted pottery that uh, one of our team members found. Uh, bones, lots of bones. Um, and we were fortunate. We had uh, Dr. Haskell Greenfield working with us. And he was helping us not just take down the bulk, but look within the the bulks, the walls for this microstratigraphy so that we could make sure that we were we were getting the right stratigraphic level as we went for the bones as we went. But but you would pull some bones out. I remember pulling out part of a jaw and a little J and, and I said, Dr. Greenfield, what kind of animal did this come from? And he he looked at it, he said, Oh, you can tell from this bone that's a that's a goat, part of a goat jaw. So so here's a the the remains of a of a sacrifice, a goat that was sacrificed thousands of years ago we we uh, someone else found a, a um half of a, a goat skull he was he was holding it so yeah that's a goat skull and you could still see the marks the lines from where they they um they butchered it right on the skull it, it was pretty some of the bones were coming out and you could tell they had been burned um so it was just a a powerful thing to be to be digging in there and quite possibly excavating uh, bones 
and pieces of pottery. Uh, people say, well, why would you, there be broken pottery from from a sacrifice? Well, when they would offer something in a, in a pottery vessel that was sacrificial, they would then break the vessel and, and bury it in this favisa because they wouldn't want to then desecrate this holy vessel by using it for something common afterwards, I think is the thinking huh. behind it. So, huh. so, the, so we're finding all kinds of pottery and bones and, and gold. This, by the way, this is the same area where last year um, they found two gold stars in this area as well, they were excavating. Um, and then the week after I left, another piece of gold came out of there. So, I mean, some archaeologists dig for, for their whole careers and never find anything gold. I go there I, day one. <laughs> I'm, I'm watching a piece of gold come out of the ground. It's a, it's a pretty amazing thing. But, it, I mean, it's one part. To me, um, honestly, I thought the gold was, was pretty cool. But archaeology, to me, isn't the treasure hunt. F- seeing that, that beautiful piece of a, of a bowl with concentric circles painted in the middle that pottery was just as exciting um, as, as the gold for me and the scarab. It's, it's all part of helping us understand what that part of the site is and when it was used and how that ties in with what, with what the Bible says. So you and everybody else kind of there has found scarabs and pottery and coins and gold and bones, and you said a little bit earlier that there's just so many pieces of pottery that have been found. Now, maybe Henry, you could jump in too. So, how important that the pottery just seems to me like trash, but how important is pottery in dating a, a level? To is that like I feel I, I've learned that pottery is really important. So, could you maybe talk a little bit about that? Yeah, it's. Uh, I mean, it's indispensable. It's our it's our primary majority way of. Uh, determining dates, you know, if you think about maybe for the, for a person thinking in the context, think about if you went to your grandmother's house and she had stuff that was made maybe in the seventies or eighties or something like that. And you looked at her dishes and then you look at your dishes that you have now, you would, you would kind of like generally see the difference between them. Mm -hmm. That It changes. Now, or cars, you know, footage from Cuba. You see 1950s vehicles driving around. You kind of know that's not a modern car. It's from 50 or 60 years ago, right? So pottery is the same is the same way. People used it for everything. So it it's any site you go to in Israel where there was an ancient occupation, there's pottery laying all over the place. Okay. Uh, experts will know when they look at it, like Dr. Stripling and others, Gary, uh, what kind of pottery it is and what from time period, if it has certain indicators on it. So this is a way of the pottery provides us with how people lived. And of course, the further you go down as a general rule, unless it's been, the site's been overturned in some way, you go further back in time. And Brian used the word stratigraphy before, you know, layers. So uh, as we get closer to the surface, we get closer to the uh, our time period. So hence, before Brian's talking about Roman material mm-hmm. in the in the uh, monumental building, beneath that is stuff that's older, and so forth and so on. So, but the but the pottery is so incredibly important, um, and it's not like. It's not controversial, isn't it? Just kind of universally accepted. Like there's, in general, there's yes, yeah, yeah. I mean, they've worked out a timeline, a relative timeline. It's pretty, it's pretty well worked out. I would say, you know, from Abraham forward. Okay, you know, before that, there's different issues involved with that. But as far as as far as because you can synchronize pottery discoveries, especially if you have places where written texts have been found, and you can sort of synchronize the dates. So you have a matrix of data to give you dates. And the more sites they dig, the more pottery we find. So we have pottery at Shiloh. Well, we have a similar pottery form found at this site and this site at Hatsur or somewhere else. So when we do the investigation of the pottery, we have to look at the what we call parallels at all these other archaeological sites. Uh, so you're not just arbitrarily dating it. You have to justify uh, the period that it's from. But the, but the general scientific community, non-Christian, shall we say, yeah. like they use the same, it's the same for everyone, but pottery wise. Yes. Yeah. So we're using all of the, the pottery parallels that have been found elsewhere. Now, 
you know, like Dr. Stripling and Dr. Byers, they've studied this for a lifetime. So, you know, they know the stuff when they look at it. But then you then you do your research later, you identify the forms that are really important. So what Brian's talking about here in the Favisa, uh, because this is specialized pottery associated with worship and sacrifice, mm-hmm. these forms are going to be specialized and different than the domestic stuff that people just use for everyday yeah, plates use. and cups. And- so that's the exciting part. Once we start doing more analysis of what's there, we'll be able to fine tune the dating and it'll just, I think, vindicate the theory already of, uh, you know, that we're working with that this synchronizes really well with the biblical chronology. Mm-hmm. So, uh, and then, and then the, the bones, uh, as another ex- exciting part of this, because if we can get some bone samples where, where collagen can be extracted, uh, then we can get some carbon 14 dates mm. and, you know, from this time period, there's a margin of error for carbon 14, but it's still reasonably close to the pottery. So that would be interesting, uh, from a scientific standpoint, uh, to see how that shakes, shakes itself out. So, I mean, what Brian has been talking about is, is, and, and not, not and the gold, and the scarab. I mean, I'm sitting here thinking, Brian, you're saying archeologists, <laughs> they can go a whole lifetime and not find any gold. You're in there in day one, you know, I, I, I was thinking, if you don't mind me doing a little spiritual application, I was thinking of, uh, Peter saying, you know, silver and gold do I have not, but, uh, you know, in the name of the Lord, Jesus Christ, uh, get up and walk or be healed. And I'm thinking, we don't need the tabernacle anymore because we have Jesus. That's all laid out in the book of Hebrews. And there you are digging in the sacrificial dump and you find gold in it. Yeah. So it's like, you've got Jesus and gold. You're like a double winner, Brian. I mean, it's, it's <laughs> unbelievable, but, uh, no, but in all seriousness, I mean, it's just, when I heard about this, I was home already. Cause I only, I'm only able to go for a couple of weeks. Uh, I was just like, I, I just can't wait to to see how this all unfolds. I mean, to find gold, I mean, it's just, it's so rare. I think we found at Kerbid El Makader over a thousand coins, we found one gold coin. Hmm. So it just shows you like, I think one and maybe like a handful of silver ones. So th- this is an extraordinary discovery hmm. and uh, it'll be interesting to see. Uh, I should add to this. So what we'll do, our team will almost certainly write an academic paper about this discovery because that's, we, we pick some of the major some of the highlights. discoveries. Yeah. Yeah. Something that's really, really important. And Brian mentioned the palm granite earlier. We've written an article about that in a technical journal. We'll do the same with the gold. And so that'll give us that, that picture of what Brian was talking about. We'll do the major research on gold in Egyptian, uh, necklaces and all that other kind of thing. So you can kind of like draw some connection. So that'll be exciting to see how that all shakes itself out. Mm-hmm. I, I should mention one more thing too. You you had asked about um, the reading of the pottery. It's not just Scott and Gary who read it. They do a primary reading. But while I was there, uh, one of the days they had, um, they bring an outside expert in to double check their reading of the pottery. Hmm. And so this is someone who is not on staff with, you know, ABR. They're not, you know, um, they're from over there. And um, it's a lady, I believe she maybe is a professor at a university over there. I can't remember her name, but she comes in and they go through the pottery again and they double check uh, the pottery to make sure that their reading is, is, is correct. And so that's one of the things I really appreciate about you know, but the way ABR does it, it's not just us going, oh, it's this. We're also, there are checks and balances in place to make sure that we're we're getting it right. Because at the end of the day, our, our goal is not to prove the Bible. Our goal is to understand this site, the history of this site. And we, we do have this ancient text called the Bible, which describes some things there. And so we're seeing how that lines up with that. And and what we're finding is that it lines up very nicely. And so um, to have outside people coming in to to work with us, and, and we have some fantastic, fantastic people. I, I was just um, astounded at the quality of people that are over there, the experts they have. So for example, one day um, Scott comes by and he says to Jordan, this is in week two, he goes, uh, Jordan, do you have anyone you could spare today? 
I need someone who will work with Orna Cohen. Now, um, within the archaeological world, Orna Cohen is a bit of a legend because she is just one of the best, if not the best, person who conserves and restores things. Her work is in museums all over, um, the major Israel museum. She was uh, telling me some of the stuff. So when when uh, Scott asked for volunteer, I shot my hand up. I said, I'll, I'll do it. <laughs> mm-hmm. I'll work with Orna for a day. And I'm like, sorry, Jordan, I'm ditching you. I'm going to work with Orna. And he's like, no, no, I don't blame you. I had to do the same thing. <laughs> so, so I got to work with her for a day, um, restoring walls that were there. And um, so just the quality of people that we have that we bring in from the outside to help us is just a, was something that I was really impressed with, with ABR's dig. You know, she had Orna Cohen is most famous for restoring the Jesus boat, the so-called yes. Jesus boat in the Galilee, uh, found in the in the mud of the, on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, like in the eighties, late eighties or something like that. Yeah. And yeah. that's what she's most famous for. But yeah, it's great having someone like her, an independent scholar who does that. It's interesting too, Brian, I think you were, we have a couple of pottery specialists. One of them is uh, Anna D. Vincenz, I think is how you pronounce her name. She does, she does later period pottery, like so Hellenistic and Roman era stuff. So the one day when they were done, I was sitting there, uh, I had just met her for the first time. And so I started asking her questions about pottery and a lot of questions that I didn't even know I had until as she was starting to answer the questions, then they were triggering more questions. And every single question I had, she not only knew the answer to, she knew like layers of answers to about Roman, not only making of pottery, but the way it was distributed and trade routes and local uh, clay that was used and how the clay in the Galilee is different than the clay from around Jerusalem. And, and it was just this, it was probably 20 minutes of me just a, like a kid kind of like just asking her his questions and a very natural conversation. So to have someone like that and others uh, as part of our uh, consulting experts uh, makes it more neutral in the sense of, you know, when we publish our scientific and academic materials, it's like, you know, these aren't just Bible thumping evangelicals out to prove the Bible or slanting the evidence. Like we're trying to hedge this in such a way, hedge is a negative word, but in a positive way that look, here's the research, here's the interpretation. It's available to you. You can do your own analysis, draw your own conclusions. Uh, Of course, we find that when you actually do all of that work and then you compare it to the biblical text, it vindicates the historicity of the text. But we're not bending the analysis to make that happen. That happens organically, and having these experts involved is just the way to do it. It's the way to do it with, as Dr. Stripling says, with excellence unto God's glory, uh, which is how we should pursue everything. Yeah. And Brian, we were talking another time and you, you mentioned another find that somebody else found. It wasn't you, so you can't claim credit for it, but it was something new that hadn't been found at that site before. I wonder if you could tell us about that. Yes. Yeah, so um, I, uh, when I was over there, my, my goal was to learn as much as I could about different parts of it. And so you know, one day I asked Jordan, I'm like, hey, Jordan, do you think you could get a uh, asked Scott if I could come and watch you guys do pottery reading for a day. So I got to do for, got to do that just, just for one part. But another part is when you get back to the hotel each afternoon, all the square supervisors go in and the, and the staff and they do object reading. So an object is an important artifact that is not pottery. So it could be a stone vessel, could be a scarab. Uh, our gold pendant was, was part of, was an object. Um, and so I went into object reading a couple of days to just to see what was there and kind of some of us who are interested, we stand along the, the back wall there and watch. And the, the object that came forward was this small shell. It was a shell. It looks like a seashell. It's actually a snail shell. And you think, uh, you, why would that be important? So I've talked to people about uh, since I've got back. And I have, you know, shown them some pictures. Now, I don't show them pictures of the actual artifacts because I don't have those. You're not allowed to take pictures of these really important finds, these artifacts. Um, While you're there, that's for the staff to do when they get ready to publish it. But I found a picture of one that looks like it, and it's a Murex snail shell. 
And uh, when it came uh, forward, Scott said, and, and this is something we've been waiting for at Shiloh, he was pretty certain that we would find one one day. And you look at that and you go, what's the big deal about a snail shell? But it's well, an ocean, ba- ocean snail. It's not like a little everyday snail, right? It's a, That's from, right. From yeah, it's, it's, it would be from the Mediterranean Sea. Okay. And um, the reason it's important is, is in antiquity, these Murex snail shells were, uh, were used, the snails either crushed everything up and, and that's how they came up with the blue purple dye that was this kind of bluish purple dye that was really sought after in antiquity. Hmm. Now, why is that important for, Sh- for Shiloh? Well, because the book of Leviticus tells us that the priest, the high priest's garment was to be made out of material that was dyed with this blue purple dye. And so if, The Bible is historically accurate, and we believe that it is. And if there were priests uh, working in a temple at Shiloh, which we believe there were, you would expect to find evidence somewhere there of this blue-purple dye because they're a ways. They're not on the the seashore. (laughs) They're 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 inland. And so finding this was, and, and interestingly enough, I didn't get the whole context, but it was found up. I know the team that found it um, was digging up by the monumental structure where we near where we had dug the first week. And so, again, we have something that can be tied to the worship of uh, the Israelites um, up at that particular site in, in an area where we think the tabernacle stood. And so uh, we'll have to wait to see what um, all of the research and the analysis shows, but to see a Murex snail shell and to hear um, its possible tie to this blue purplish dye that, that, that the priestly garments were made of was again, just a, another important thing that connects with with scripture and you you start adding all of these little things together and you start to see a picture emerging that ties in with what the bible says was going on at shiloh um, in the late bronze age and early iron age periods when the israelites were worshiping there was that pretty intact brian i haven't seen a i haven't seen a picture of that Uh, yeah yeah it was a fully intact um, snail shell. About, uh, what, ex- ab- about what size are those? Uh, I would have said probably two and a half inches, maybe okay. uh, two inches. Like it, it, I just, I would, I'm at the back of the room kind of watching sure. as they, as they hold it up. So, but it, it was pretty exciting to see. Yeah. It looked intact to me from my end. Yeah. That, um, that, that purple dye, I mean, that was traded for centuries in antiquity in the Mediterranean. Uh, the Phoenicians were who were really just descendants of the Canaanites. In fact, that's where the Romans got the name where they called the Phoenicians Punic. That's where the purple name comes from. It went all the way out to the Western Mediterranean, to North Africa. It's mentioned in the New Testament too, in the book of Acts. So it has a long pedigree in antiquity because it was just continued to be used for all the, for centuries. Uh, but the, but the intriguing part for us, obviously, is the, is the connection in the earlier period, right? Yeah. So... The fact that we found one intact implies, you know, it's not a one-off. We might not find one more there, but it it means they had more than one there. They may have stockpiled it. Yeah, and because it had, to be, it, to- it had to be brought there th- through some kind of trade, through a caravan or something like that. So you have to be careful about extrapolating. You know, you want to go based on what you find, but the inference is pretty is pretty strong, I, I, I would think. And I wouldn't be surprised if we found found more or at least maybe remnants of it finding one intact they're pretty fragile you know get smashed over time so pretty exciting though yeah it's interesting so when you when you make a big find at at uh, Shiloh one the the prize that you get is um is is Scott buys you an ice cream bar at the end of the day at the gift shop <laughs> so um so Irene who found our scarab uh Irene got an ice cream bar the next day. Um, when this team found the the shell, Scott bought the entire team ice cream bars because it was it's an important find that you would expect to find something like that there. And again, right now, it's, it's just come out of the ground this year. I'm just talking about it because I happen to see it there. I want to wait and to see... Um, you know when they when they publish it, um, you know the the research on it and and find out more. All I'm saying is it isn't isn't it interesting? The Bible says that there were priests there and that they had to wear 
uh, garments that were made uh, with this blue purple dye. And isn't it interesting? We happen to find at this place where the priests were in a structure that we think is the tabernacle, a shell from which you get <laughs> blue purple dye. And so um, it's just an interesting possible connection. Look forward to seeing what uh, what those who found it uh, publish when they when they get to that. So obviously it sounds like you had a good time and it was a, a really moving experience for you to be there. Now kind of looking back at everything, how has it changed your life? How has it made you think about, have you, do you think about anything differently now that you've done it for yourself? Yeah, I've, I've often heard from people who travel to Israel that they never read the Bible the same way again. And I can see why that is now. Uh, I can see why that is. When I read um, the stories in the Bible, these accounts from uh, Shiloh or Shiloh, I, I can picture it in my mind where it is. Um, we, my wife, the the hotel that we stay at, the team stays at, is in Jerusalem, just north of the the uh, the, the Temple Mount. It's it's actually like a eight or nine minute walk from the hotel to the Damascus Gate, and you're right in the old city. And I remember walking across our final day there. My wife and I walked across the Kidron Valley to go to the Mount of Olives to overlook Jerusalem. And I, I said to Jen, it's amazing the history that happened here. Jesus, we know from the Gospels, went from the temple uh, across the Kidron Valley and spent the night on the Mount of Olives. That's what we're told in the Gospel of Luke. But it's also the roughly the same route that King David took when he left Jerusalem, when the, um, the, the coup was happening with his son Absalom and he had to flee, he crossed the Kidron Valley and up to the Mount of Olives as well. And so, so all of these things happening in the same area from both the Old Testament and the New Testament, and to be able to picture those now um, and to have a little bit more of the historical background is, is pretty exciting. I, I took a day trip while I was there to Jericho to do some research for my thesis and and to to be at Jericho and to see it and to stand at the top of the tell and to look out and to see right across the the Jordan River kind of where you can see you know Jordan and and the area over there and just to think of the history that happened at that site is is pretty amazing i can see how people say they never read the Bible the same way again, to realize for me coming from Canada, which is a, a massively huge country, to go to Israel and see how small it is and how close everything is and all these events that happened, it, it's, it's, it helps me to understand. It gives me a little bit better background, both geographically and historically, what's happening when I read the Bible now today. Awesome. Well, thanks for sharing all your experience with us as Interesting to learn some new things and hear about kind of through your eyes for the first time. I thought that was really cool. Yeah. And you know what? Um, I, I think it's, I don't know, Henry will know when they, uh, when they open up for volunteers, but if you've never been there, um, come on over and, uh, and join us. We have a, there's a saying I learned in Jerusalem. I, I think it's an old saying. And the, the saying is next year in Jerusalem. <laughs> and so that's been the thought going through my mind um, as I think about uh, going back next year in Jerusalem. So if any of our listeners want to join us, uh, come on over and uh, dig at Shiloh with us. Yeah, we'd love, we'd love to have you. No, no experience required. We usually open up registration around Labor Day or so is our goal each year. Right, Brian? I mean, this was yep. your first year and it was, they heard how great of experience it was. I experienced the same thing the first time I went, uh, same kind of thing. And you never, you never lose the excitement and passion for it. It's just, it's just great being there. So we invite, uh, invite our audience to join us, uh, digshiloh.org. Uh, we'd love to have you. Digging for Truth is a presentation of the Associates for Biblical Research. To find out more about ABR, just go to BibleArchaeology.org.